Hello, welcome to another episode. We've interviewed a number of the Rave Scene's original members, and if there were badges given out for founding members, then today's guest would have a big fuck-off shiny medal. Since getting into rave music at the start of the Acid House movement, Jumping Jack Frost has been at the forefront of the scene from the very start, and he remains so to this day. Frankly, there's not much Frost, whose real name is Nigel Thompson, hasn't experienced during his crazy life and career as a leading DJ and co-owner of the legendary drummer bass label V Recordings, along with Brian G., which he fully admits saved him from a life as something of a nerd well. So uh, without further ado, let's get him on now. It's me old Mark and Nigel. Hello, mate. How are you doing? Hey. How's it going, I, fi- I finally got you on. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> yeah, so people, really- people that don't know, <laughs> Frost came on my talk sports show a long, long time ago and talked about his, his love of Man United. And uh, it's not going to be quite that today. It's going to be a bit different, but it's good to see you. How are you getting on, mate? I'm good, bro. Do you know what I mean? I'm good, man. Just, you know, um, pandemic's been crazy, but I've mm. kept myself busy with various little projects. So, yeah, I'm grateful, man. Good. Well, we'll come to those uh, a bit later. But you've, you've said in the past, and I've, you know, you've got a book, by the way, Big, Bad and Heavy. It's a fantastic read. It's on its third press, so it means it's obviously selling Ooh. quite well. Ooh. Fourth, there you go. Oh, right. I, I don't want to under under undervalue your presses, uh, but you're on the fo- you're on the fourth press, which means it's obviously selling well. And I'm not surprised. It's such a great book, full of. Oh, uh, yeah. just just read it. Just go and read it because it's really great. But um, you've said many times, including in your book, that music was your savior. What do you yeah. think your life would look like without the rave scene and music? Boy, um, who's to know? Because you know, I was like. I was on the streets with the guys, up to all kinds of shit, man. Do you know what I mean? Um, I, I would have probably been in prison, man, definitely, or in some gang or dead. No, I, I don't think I'd be dead. I, I think I was too smart for that. Do you know what I mean? I, I probably would have. I don't know. I don't know, but it 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 wouldn't have been good. Do you know what I mean? It wouldn't have been good. No, it wouldn't. Well, it's good for us that you did manage to find music because uh, you've brought us so many fantastic tunes over the years through V uh, and a couple of your own as well. Um, you've been 35 years now in the rave scene. Well, since the very start, really, which is about 35 uh, years. What is it that you love about the rave scene and keeps you involved? And as we said, remaining right at the forefront of it. Um, it's just, first and foremost, it's just the music, you know. The music's always been the first and foremost thing that that has kept me going and just kept me motivated just the way that it always evolves and just and and also the love of the people the way that people just embrace me and embrace the music and embrace our label v and and everything that we do do you know what i mean it just just the love of the people it's like a big family in it a rave family do you know what i mean whether you come from jungle whether you come from a hardcore, like we all know each other, it's like a big family. Do you know what I mean? And like over the years, I've got to know a lot of the ravers as well. Do you know what I mean? So that's that's what keeps me going, man. Is that something that you never really experienced prior to getting into the rave scene? Yeah, like I didn't because you know I come from like a I come from like a really hostile background where everything was. Do you know what I mean? There was fights, there was gangs, there was all kinds of stuff going on. So just to you know, what I mean, get into something and see so many, so much love and so much positive vibes and people encouraging each other it was a beautiful thing for me. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and what, I mean, you mentioned hardcore, but you didn't go down the hardcore route after. Uh, I did. I, you, know, I, 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 you know, I started off, I started off with that. You know, I, I, I kind of started off doing hardcore. Obviously. But it was all hardcore when you did it. It went to hardcore and then we kind of, you know, you know I mean, I was playing like a lot of hardcore. And then it just kind of, you know, we just all went our own ways. I went into jungle and, do you know what I mean? Other people went and played hardcore. But, yeah, I played hardcore. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I played hardcore. I played a set that I played a set with Bunter about two years about two years ago. Mm-hmm. Danny, where was it we went? I forgot the name of the place. The, somewhere down up north, me and Bunter played a hardcore set. Do you know what I mean? I, I got the old tunes out and I banged it out. <laughs> dusted them down <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> well so but you are you did go down the route of drum and bass and jungle through, through yeah. V and, 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 and you know the drum and bass and jungle scene would, would look very very different without you and without yeah. V but what is it specifically about drum and bass and jungle as a genre that, that appealed to you uh, as opposed to just the, the wider rave scene I don't know because maybe it's something that 
that um, I was very much part of watching evolve and I was very much kind of part of the process. Do you know what I mean? Of of it evolving. One minute, one minute we were playing like hardcore and all that. And then the next thing, we just had this shift that there's a few a few of us together, just all made together and ended up being jungle, drum and bass. Do you know what I mean? So watching the the the, the movement start and and being part of the process is is something that you just can't just shake off just like that. Do you know what I mean? Because it's like it's ingrained in you, it's part of your life. You know what I mean? And 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 how do you view this the current scene, which you of course helped to build? You've devoted your entire adult life to it. How does it feel to see it in its current shape? Yeah, it's 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 all good because you know you've got these kids out there doing their thing, like really putting their stamp on it, really bringing something else to the table, really, do you know what I mean? And and and, and doing a great job, doing a great job, man. And and there's some really good tunes out there, there's good producers out there. It's really healthy, do you know what I mean? Because you've got all these strands and all these fractions, but it's all part of the same jungle drum based family, you know what I mean? And it's just, it's beautiful to watch all these strands grow into beautiful flowers that bloom. Beautiful. What a, what a lovely phrase. Uh, we'll talk more about that very shortly here on Raw. We're going to talk first about your how you got into the scene, how you became uh, a DJ and all that sort of thing here on Raw. Oi, oi, go check out the new digital six-track EP, A New Hype, from the 14-year-old DJ Seema. Yes, 14 on full the call recordings. I mean, sounds more ravey in Essex than Warrington, though, doesn't it? We really hope you're enjoying yet another one of Raw's in-depth interviews about the rave scene, which we are proud to say are now all curated into the British Library Sound Archive. All of us here at Raw HQ love how much you love what we do, and your generous one-off donations have been a huge help in covering our initial costs. But we're now a team of five, putting in a combined 80 hours a week for no wages, with big plans to expand further, and so our costs are going up. As such, we could really use your help to keep Raw growing and developing, as you've seen us do since our launch in July 2020. First up, go and check out our brand new website. It's rawuk.com, where you can find loads of cool extra content, and you can grab Raw's first ever range of merchandise. That's rawuk.com for our new flashy website. We've also launched a new membership scheme where you can support us financially to create more content on an ongoing basis for less than the price of an oat milk cappuccino. Plus, you get great perks in return. Head to patreon.com forward slash raw UK pods. That's patreon.com forward slash raw UK pods to see exactly what's on offer. You can also join our YouTube membership, which is basically the same. Uh, or if you're not asked about a membership, but you'd like to support us with a few quid as a one-off or a repeat donation, then head to our website and click the PayPal link. A reminder of that new website URL yet again, rawuk.com. Big love and respect to you all. Please keep supporting us. Hope you enjoy the rest of the app. Friday the 20th of August 2021, a new event, Return to Source, celebrating 90s rave, hardcore, jungle, happy hardcore, drum and bass and techno, touches down at Suki 10C in Digbeth, Birmingham. We have Fusion South Coast legend DJ Druid, Quest and Fiber Optics DJ Fallout, the uprising northern legend that is DJ Paul Owens and London Town's final trickster playing his first happy hardcore set in over 18 years. Tickets are priced at only £14. Just search Facebook and Eventbrite for Return to Source Rave. So, Nigel Frost, uh, going back to your youth, you, you say in your book, and you and you said earlier in this interview as well. It's by the way that the book, I'm flinchingly honest about some of your past poor, poor behaviour uh, and your use as well of of weapons and that sort of thing. I mean, it really is a hair raising read. Um, your childhood was tough. In yeah. what way was your childhood tough? Because um, I, I grew up in an environment that was, you know, I grew up in an environment that was really hostile. Do you know what I mean? And at the time. I grew up like in the in the eighteen in the early eighties. You know I mean, like as a teenager, I was a teenager in the early eighties. Um, 
and it was tough. There was gangs, there was a lot of police brutality. Do you know what I mean? Because I lived in Brixton and I still do. Do you know what I'm saying? So there's a lot of police, police brutality, police fitting you up, different gangs, different factions of gangs, all from the same area, but different factions of gangs. We used to fight against people from other areas. And a lot of a lot of bad stuff happened, do you know what I mean? So you 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 became uh, a petty criminal when you were young, which I, I suppose isn't a huge surprise given the uh, given the background that you came from. Was it was it impossible to avoid given all you know about yourself and where you came from? <laughs> um, I think it was impossible because um, all my friends are criminals. My dad was a criminal. You know what I mean. My uncles were criminals. Right. And I just, that's that's the environment that I grew up in. Do you know what I mean? And um, yeah, that's what I've done for. That's what I've done for. for well, a lot of people do follow their father, don't they, into their profession. So yeah, yeah. if your dad's a criminal, I suppose, not wholly surprised that that was the route you went down. Um, and, uh, you know, look, I said in your book that you talk quite openly about your use of weapons. I mean, you talk about knifing someone in revenge for slashing your face when you were young. But that sounds like it quite shook you, that that experience. Did, did, it, did it change you? Yeah, because, you know, i had done a, a couple of previous things to people before that. And, um, it, you know, it just didn't bother me. You know what I mean? But I think the old... And plus as well, I, my, my oldest daughter had just been born then as well. And I think when, my, when you have a kid, I was 19, 18, 19, I just had a kid something just dawned on me that, you know, you can't carry on living like this. Do you know what I mean? And I, so I started de developing a bit more passion, um, compassion and empathy and just love for, for humanity. Do you know what I mean? And um, and I, was, I just kind of just didn't want to do, didn't want to be like that anymore. I didn't want to be like that anymore. Do you know what I mean? It just, just yeah, it was, it was just, I just felt a strong feeling that I don't want to be this guy anymore. Well, you've, we'll come back to it because you've had periods where you've slipped into some of your old uh, ways and, and, and that, that, that is, well, look, it's not surprising, is it? And that is something that uh, characterises a lot of your book. And we'll come back into why you might slip it back into that, how you're able to, uh, I don't know, mod moderate it, I suppose. Um, but in terms of, uh, I suppose, that change in your personality came around at quite an opportune moment because it was when you really first got into DJing, wasn't it? It was... I think you learned about mixing from your first girlfriend, and I mean, what yeah, a slide, right. what a sliding doors moment. Um, my question is, do you think that if your girlfriend hadn't introduced you to mixing, you'd have found it anyway? Um, yeah, because what it was, what it was, she didn't introduce me to mixing, right? I had this thing, this this cassette, and I was like, wow, what's this? And she's like, that's mixing, you fool. And I was like, mixing, yeah. So. <laughs> You know what I mean? She just showed me what she just told me what it was. I was like, "Why was that?" You know what I'm saying? And then you took that and you really ran with it. I mean, talk about taking the bull by the horns. You were uh, that's why you're here, being interviewed uh, some thirty or five plus years later. And but what yeah. is it about your personality, Nigel, that um, made you focus? Because you basically talk in the book about you went right. I am working on this. I'm going to make this my thing now. What is it about your personality that made you focus so hard on the DJing so, and practice so hard that you were able to become a, a pro? I'm. Um, I went to. I went to boarding school. Yeah, and um, I got. A, I've liked to think I've got a really good work ethic. Do you know what I mean? And I'm. I'm quite determined as well. So if I put my mind to something, I'm going to really try my best at it and devote myself to it. I remember when I started playing tunes in my house, right, and I, I, I had a room full of records and there were just two decks in there and records everywhere. You're talking about thousands of records. And then there's like a little patch with the decks and all that. It's just like, do you know what I mean? And like a little alley so you could get out. And I remember <laughs> my girlfriend at the time was next door. When I finished and I came out, I didn't even notice when she left and I never saw her again. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Your hat, do you know Pete Cannon, by the way, who's a, he's a jungle DJ now? His, I've been in his studio, which is also his bedroom, and it's a little bit like that by the sounds of things. So I've got, I could, I've got a picture in my mind of, of, of what it is. Um, yeah. Is that competitive nature? Does that come from your time on the streets? Um, I don't think it's competitive. I think it's just focused. Okay. Do you know what I mean? I... I I'm competitive, but in other things, not in, not in, I mean, the only person I try to compete with is myself, just to just, do you know what I mean? Because everyone's got to be different, do you know what I mean? And everyone brings something different to the table. I think I'm just focused and determined, do you know what I mean? Mm. I'm 
one of those people that like I could dream up a project. And I'm like, you know what? I want to do this, and I'm going to do it. Do you know where does I mean? that Where does that come from? I don't know. I don't know. I I, ref, I just refuse to lose. It's I a ref- really good. I mean, it's a really good mindset, uh, particularly partic- particularly in a in a, in in such a cutthroat. Uh, and competitive industry like yeah. yours to I I'm suppose is that why you've kept so successful over the years maybe so and, and and I think and I always try to look at ways to adapt and grow and um and expand do you know what I mean and and I'm, I'm very teachable I don't, and I mean I don't mind learning right I'm very teachable and I don't mind I'm not worried those people that's oh I know it all I don't know it all do you know what I mean? Mm. I'm very teachable, I'm coachable, and I, I, I can listen to anyone and just learn something from them. Doesn't matter how long, doesn't matter that I've been in the game for so long. There are people that just come in now that can teach me things. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm very, you know, I, I like to think I'm, I, I, sometimes when you listen, you learn, you know what I mean? You learn more than if you talk. Do you know what I'm saying? So I like to, I like to learn. What I what I notice um, from social media, but also from chatting to you, and uh, and what just what I know what I know of you is you are an insatiable and incredibly successful networker, right? So you know everyone, right? Oh, by the way, for anyone listening on audio, uh, typically he's just skinning up a joint. (laughs) Why not? Like, why not? Cack, you crack on, buddy. You are the first person, by the way, to skin up live on Raw, but uh, you know, I'm I'm fine with it. you're an insatiable networker and is that part of it because I, you know i i sort of have always viewed networking i think i'm quite a good networker as well but the net, i've never really thought about it in the way of like i learn from people i've always thought it's attach yourself to to interesting people and you'll find yourself in in interesting worlds no, you might be a call and, but is something. there also a part of learning for you uh, I, from learned, your networking? I, learned, I learned something i picked up from the great joe rogan yeah and he says you know what I like to listen to people that are smarter. I always surround myself with people that are smarter than me. That's what I do. Do you know what I mean? I always surround myself with people that are smarter than me. And um, that's the way I grow. That's a, It's a really um, cl- clever way of doing it. And, and and actually, I think that a lot of people can't do that because... So I come from newspapers, and often what would happen is, you know, the editor would surround themselves by not that impressive people because they didn't want them to steal their jobs, for instance, you know? So people are very worried about other people stealing their mantle. But I suppose, and this is a question to you, are you so confident in yourself and your abilities that you don't care about that because you know they're not going to they're not going to take that you know and so actually you're better with people surrounded by people with bright you know I, I, don't, I, skills. I don't even i don't even that mindset doesn't even come into it right. i just crack on that mindset doesn't even come into it i don't even think like that i don't even okay. think like that. i just do what i'm doing and i just surround myself with who i want to surround myself with people that make me click people that challenge me people that question me people that push me people that will say no no that's not right that's you know what i mean and, and that's my mindset how so, does um how does a man um who has admitted in his book quite a lot um that he has not dealt with uh anger sometimes quite as well as he might and we'll come on to that later how yeah. does he accept being told no it's part of growth part of growth i've grown a lot since the days of being a hellraiser and being a being a gangbanger or whatever it is, you know what I mean? A kid in the block doing fucking fucked up shit. I've grown a lot since then. I'm a grandfather now. Do you know what I mean? And I've, you know, after a while you accept. I, I, I can't afford to react the way I used to react. Do you know what I mean? I can't afford to do that. Do you know what I'm saying? It's called growth and it's called, you know, humility. Getting, up, getting old. Getting older, man. <laughs> That's basically it, right? Yeah. We all do it. We all do it, don't we? We all do it. Um. Uh, so let's talk about V Recordings because setting up V with Brian G was pretty pivotal, it seems, as far as I can see, to your longevity in the scene. Um, we've heard his version of how you first met on the podcast. And if you haven't listened to that already, go and do so. It's a really great episode. Um, what's your version of events? Um. Well, I, um, I met Brian originally... I went to his house to buy some weed. Do you know what I mean? And um, he thought I was, I think he thought I came to rob him because that's what I was known for doing, robbing people. Do you know what I'm saying? So, but I mean, I didn't, I, I just, I didn't want to rob him. I just wanted to buy some weed. And then I, I met him another time. He was playing in a bar. Um, and I had some watches that I was selling. 
So I went in and asked me if it was to buy a watch. And he said, yeah, I'll buy a watch. And then he said, we've got to wait till after I finished. Do you know what I mean? I just see this, look. Look at that. No, up higher. Oh, yeah. T what, the TF? Team Frost. Ah, yes. Kaboom. All right, going back to what I was saying. So... <laughs> Was he, are you just dropping in an advert mid mid sentence? Yeah, fine, why, not? No, fine, why not? Why not? Why not? So, so uh, now look, yeah, Brixton Streetwear. <laughs> how come I haven't got any of them? Team Frost. We've known each other for how long, and I haven't got one of them. You, you you're failing. You're not doing it properly. You have got to get me some. Anyway, crack on. Go on. C talk about Brian. How you met? Yeah. So, uh, so I said to him, "Do you want to buy a watch?" He said, "Yeah, you got to wait till afterwards." So afterwards. We started to because he was playing, and you know, I just started, we just started talking about music. I don't even think he ended up buying a watch in the end. Do you know what I mean? We just started talking about music, and that's how I met him. Then, you know what I mean? Then we went on to we were in the pirate station together, and then we just we was in the pirate station for a while. And then, you know, cut a long story short, we ended up setting up the label in 1992 because it's a long story, and um, the rest is history, man. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk very shortly about that. But um, did you know instantly you'd work together? You know, did you realise that actually he's got skills that you don't have and you've got skills that he doesn't at that have? Time, at that time, I was still kind of on the streets. I was still kind of half in the streets, but I liked the idea of being into music. Do you know what I mean? I'd always liked music, but I'd kind of, I just had enough of being on the streets. Do you know what I mean? And doing, doing stuff I was doing, like robbing and doing whatever I was, do you know what I mean? There's a lot of stuff, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And um, I learned enough of it, do you know what I'm saying? So I just, you know, I, I really liked music and I had a lot of music because one of my uncles was a, a DJ back in the day and he was had loads of funk and he, he gave me all these records and I liked it, do you know what I mean? I liked that vibe, do you know what I mean? So yeah, I, you know, meeting up with Brian was, you know, I just thought, this is, it, I like being around guys like this, this is, this is more me now. Do you know what I'm saying? And I kind of just kind of left that street vibe behind and I started hanging out with Brian and, you know I mean, some other people. And I, I, at that time, I was I was going to Soul to Soul at Africa Centre. Do you know what I mean? And I got quite friendly with Jazzy B and Trevor Nelson and those, those guys as well. And I started kind of going there all the time and it was it was, it was good vibes, man. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I was, so... It wasn't yeah. originally rave music that you were into. You got into oh, rave music like, after. Like rave yeah. and even funk, and yeah. you know what I mean? That was my thing, man. But like... you got into rave music after your first rave at Clink Street. It was quite an eye opener for you, wasn't it? As a as a, as a guy from the streets who's uh, more likely to juck oh. someone than hug someone. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck! Yeah, true though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, man. What fuck. did you think when you went in there? <clears throat> that was crazy because. I went in there and like me and Brian was like, what the fuck, man? Like, you know what I mean? It's like Colin Favor was playing. Um Colin, Colin Favor, Colin Hud, do you know what I mean? Eddie Richards, my good friend, like, you know what I mean? Um, and it was like, wow, what the hell is this, man? It was crazy. I was like, what the fuck? Do you know what I mean? But um it was like, it was weird because people were just like buzzing at their head. And I was like, what's going on here, man? Me and Brian was like, what's going on? <laughs> like, people trying to offer me water. I was like, nah, man, nah, what are you talking about, man? And like, everyone was like, do you want some water? And I, I wasn't used to that kind of thing, you get me? I wasn't used to it. I was like, what the fuck? You know, there's something about it. But then, I, then, then I went back the next time, and the next time we got it, do you know what I mean? Went bam. And then that was it, man. I was like, that was it. We just went in. Well, so so, what was it about the rave scene and the music, which is, of course, uh, famously based upon the idea of peace and love, that appealed to a violent oik from Brixton? I don't know, because I'm a music guy, you know, I'm a music guy. I've always, I'm a music guy, but I think it was just a com because at the time we had, um, you know, we was like playing a pirate station, and this just it's just something about it. Both we just both got it. We just got it. Do you know what I mean? And um. It just hit us like a train, man. You know what I mean? This music. And um, we were, you know, we were just from then, we just went head first into it. And obviously, we're from Brixton. People were like, you, what kind of devil music you lot are playing, man? Do you know what I mean? People were, they weren't too happy about it because we'd gone from playing Rare Groove and Soul and all that on the station to overnight playing Acid House. And they're like, what the fuck is this, man? Do you know what I mean? 
That is not too quick. There was a tune one time called Jesus Loves Acid. There was another one called Dance With The Devil. You know what I mean? People are like, what the fuck? So, but, you know. <laughs> Always, uh, always busy. Uh, phone going for you. Um, so, could you? It strikes me that reading your book, one of the most amazing things you found was that Rave didn't seem to see race. Um, can you imagine how life changing that must have been for so many people? That is, that's a, so this is what what people don't get. The Rave scene brought together people from all backgrounds that would never ever have got together. It was a social. It was a social just explosion, do you know what I'm saying? Like, this is when you've got all the barriers and races and everything broken down because everyone came together, do you know what I mean? I've, I've met people from all different backgrounds and everything, food is food is, food is way of life, food is culture, that's what I'll call it, I'll call it a culture, do you know what I'm saying? Because it's rave culture, do you know what I mean? Which is, it, the, 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 it, that's what you call rave, you know what I mean? Like, real rave, real culture that everyone coming together from all backgrounds, it didn't matter, it was all one, you understand what I'm saying? And that is, that, that's a beautiful thing. And it was like, born out of the UK, it was born right here in the UK, that love and that unity between everyone, do you know what I mean? That, it really did change you, didn't it? <laughs> it, changed, it, changed, it changed the world, it changed everything, man. Do you know what I mean? That's the, that's the bottom line, it changed everything. Yeah. And you didn't do ecstasy then. Uh, obviously, everyone was, although you probably didn't know it because you've never done it before. But um, no, I've never done it again. What Not about later? Again. A little bit later, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, I didn't really. I wasn't really big on ecstasy though. It's not your sort of drug. No, I did. I enjoyed it sometimes, but I was. I was into other things. <laughs> we know. We'll come to it. Um, how important have drugs been in your professional life? They've been good and they've been bad as well, man. Do you know what I'm saying? They've been good and they've been bad. Yeah. Again, we'll come on to that later. What about for the for the wider rave scene? Would it have existed in the same way were it not for that little pill? No. No, that little pill there was like, it was just the craziest thing. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's the pill and the records. Talking about records, do you want to look at my coasters? Go for it. Lovely. Very oh, cool. Look. He's got records. If you're listening on audio, he's got little f floppy records as coasters. Yeah. I mean, the right. most surprising thing is Jumping Jack Frost has got coasters. I uh, thought you'd just whack your drink down anywhere, buddy. No, you can't. You've got to have a coaster for fuck's sake. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> uh, coming up after very shortly, we're going to talk more about your how you moved into the rave scene and, uh, and how you eventually developed V and went on to great worldwide success, including winning awards. It's about a pressure. It's about a roar. So uh, jumping Jack Frost, Nigel Thompson, we've had a, a question in from one of our audience because we always ask our audience if uh, if they've got any questions for the guests that we've got. If anyone wants to get in touch with us, they can do uh, hello at rawuk.com and also on all our social media channels at rawukpods. Darren Johnson asks, from listening to Raw podcasts, all the drum and bass boys mention what an influence and legend you were to them. Who was your influences? Oh, man. Um, I was influenced by... When I first started off, I used to play. I used to play at the fridge right every Thursday with Paul Trouble and Anderson, and Eddie Richards. Do you know what I mean? And those two guys had a massive influence on me, man. Because um, you know, just watching Paul's mixing skills and the way he selected tunes, and Eddie was just like a, a scientist. Eddie Richards. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I then went from playing there to be on Eddie Richards agency which is the, probably the first agency in the uk called dynamix so eddie was eddie which is in port anderson with really big influences on me you know i mean as as people as well really nice guys very you know what i mean eddie especially eddie was super professional do you know what i mean and um i got a lot of i got a lot of thing from him and also also um i spent a lot of time myself and brian with um, a guy called Dave Lee, do you know what I mean? Who's um, a lot of people that you, that you might more know as Joey Negro. So I spent a lot of time around him, around the office and stuff, and um, learning that the, the, the behind the scenes business kind of stuff. 
about about how to run labels and stuff like that. So we got a good insight from right. from from early about how to run things. So. And that must have been yeah, hugely valuable. By the way, Brian, I'm, you know, I'm sure you know this. Brian said on our podcast how jealous he was that you got on that agency and you were getting all these gigs. And he was like, I want to go. I'm good too. I'm good too. Um, you did grow up at a time when South London DJs just blew up. Why do you think that South London produced so many big rave DJs at that point? I don't know. You know, you know I think as well, I think that I think that most of the most of the good parties and that were in South London. Do you know what I mean? And uh, like we play that, we play that, um, we play that car wash every Friday, every Friday, Saturday. Me, Groove, Fabio, and Brian. Do you know what I mean? And then you know all the guys from Tintin and Jeremy and all those guys from Energy used to come down there. So we knew them all. So we got to play at the really big parties. Do you know what I mean? Like you had, other, you had places like Crowden Road. And all that. I never, I never went there in my life. Do you know what I mean? Crowley Road is like a legendary place, like in East London. I just always heard the name. I think it was in East London, but I never went there in my life. Right? Do you know what I mean? Because I was just always playing over south. It's only when, the only time that I started kind of mixing up with the other guys, DJs from East London, and that is when telepathy started at Marshgate Lane. Before that, do you know what I mean? And maybe because I played at Labyrinth a couple of times when it first started off. But other than that, I was always in the South. And I just right. done Sunrise and Energy and the big, big parties. I never really done like a lot of the other, like the, do you know what I mean? The smaller, I never really done those ones. So I think that it was, I think it was down to, you know, you know we used to play, we used to play Kensington High Street, the park and places like that. But in, in, the, in the West End, like Busby's, Breakfast Club and things. So, I think we had like the better venues and the more it was more glamorous. Do you know what I mean? Right. Okay. I think. Uh, uh, Fabio I, talks in your book because you, you in the book there's lots of um, <clears throat> uh, what would you say uh, little uh, pieces from other people who write about you and about meeting you and about all about the, the age and that sort of stuff. And Fabio talks in the book about a competition between him and Groove and you and Brian. Um, I know that you mates, I get that, but did you feel that? Competition between them, and what were your recollections of that rivalry? Um, I don't know. I, I never. We was obviously we all we all wanted to be like the top dogs in it because we was all in all from the same area. Do you know what I mean? We all wanted to be like the top dogs, but um, I don't know. It's it was. I think it was a very friendly, quiet rivalry. Do you know what I mean? Because <laughs> we were all very respectful of each other. We all loved each other. Do you know what I mean? But it, yeah, it was. It was a very, it was very, yeah, it was very secretive, quiet, right rivalry. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> is there a still a rivalry or is that gone? Nah, that's gone. We're, that's we're gone. like brothers, man. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, that's we're great. Like it's really great. Uh, uh, you've admitted as well um, that you weren't the best DJ. Um, no, never. What, what was your USP then? What, what what was it about you that's given you such a, a, a exalted career? Um, I don't know. I think I'm just committed, determined. Um, I've got a love of music and a, a passion for music and a, a passion for people. And I'm, and I'm not a bad DJ. I'm not like the worst DJ in the world, but I'm not the best either. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I've just got a passion for music and I, and I like to think I'm connected to people. I'm a people person. The thing about it as well, as well, a lot of people get the wrong impression of me because sometimes I might have a serious face and I'm like, People, you know what I mean? But I'm a nice guy. You know what I mean? I also think I'm a nice guy. You know what I mean? But you're a nice guy. You're you're very thoughtful. You're very giving. You're very gentle, actually, for someone. I mean, that's it makes me sound really weird. But like, I mean, you are gentle for <laughs> given that you given where you've come from. I will say, you know, and you've and you've got a good moral compass. You know, despite the fact that you've lived quite a, a life where the moral compass was perhaps a bit askew for a bit. But you know, you do you do you do have that. I wonder really, like, because. You are in it. You are a great networker, but you're also really good at your own PR and your own branding. You know, Team Frost, for example, is a great exa is is a great example of that. But I wonder if you were sort of in a way one of those uh, because you know nowadays it's all about image, isn't it? With DJing, yeah. you know, a lot of these house DJs, it's all about how good they look and all that. And it's the same with drum and bass and some of it, the modern stuff. But back in the day, were you sort of one of the early um, sort of proponents of? 
creating a brand around yourself and people wanting to come and see you because they're interested in you as a person? I don't know. I just, I just thought I was. I tell you what. I tell you what. I tell you a story. Me and Brian, yeah, it's like when we first put the first V Classic out, yeah. I remember just before that we done a tour in America, yeah. And when we got to New York, we saw all these little stickers on every lamppost. Rather that like someone stuck them on saying, "Who is Cameron?" This is just before Cameron came out, right? And we were like, "Who is Cameron?" Fuck, I want to know who Cameron is. And that's when I started learning the art of marketing. That's, and, I, and I looked at it, and then I started watching Master P and how Master P done his thing. And I kind of took that that way of marketing and selling yourself and applied it to myself. And when, when, we, done, when we put the first V Classic hat with the tin, we done that exact same thing. We had the Planet V logo, at every sticker in, um, or st stuck on every lamppost and traffic light in London because it, I employed a street team, but I originally got the idea from New York. Right. So that's how, you know what I mean? Picking yeah. up little bits of information as you go and going, oh, that will be useful. That will work well. Yeah, yeah, interesting. <laughs> and, and Shane Johnson on Facebook asks, why the name Jumping Jack Frost? Oh. I wanted you must, something. Know, you must know the answer to this. <laughs> you must I wanted something that people could remember. Do you know what? I'll give you, I'll give you an example, right? <laughs> semiotics. You know what semiotics is? Semiotics is like something. It sounds like something. It's, this is how you sell things. It sounds like something that you've heard before, right? It's the same as a V logo. It looks like something that you've heard before. So when I first started off, people would come to me and say, I remember you. I heard you play. But actually, you haven't. But it, it sounds like you have because of the name. Right. But why did you get it? Where did it come from? How did you, how did you invent it? Um, we had, um, my name before was called Underworld. That was my original name. They've like, done all right. Huh? <laughs> Underworld all right. have done all right. <laughs> yeah, that was my original name. That was before them. That was way before. That was my original name, Underworld. And then um, we were in the pirate station, me and Brian, the same pirate station, but we was going for a license to get a license. But we still wanted to be, so they said, if you apply for a license, everyone's got to come off air. But we still wanted to be on air. So we changed the name of the station and we all had to change our names. And they said, everyone come up with a with a, a little alias. And mine was Jumping Jack Frost. But it, the show became so, it just hit off, boom. And I was like, okay, I wasn't going back to Underworld. That's exactly how it went down. Right, but what, why jumping Jack Frost? What was it? Did you see it somewhere? Did you go, Oh, that's a good name? No, like, it just, it just, I just came up with it. Okay, um, and Robert West asks, How high can jumping Jack Frost jump? Not very high, <laughs> <laughs> you've only got little legs, mate. Yeah, I'm only little, do you know what I mean? I, yeah, I, but I, what about what about in terms of your proportion? Because you know, obviously, you're not going to jump as high as a high jumper, but in terms of your body size, well, to how high you could go, I could do a little thing, I could. Do some like dunk <laughs> like, uh, you know. <laughs> I think basketball is not for you, but but yeah. football. No, you're not, do, you're I, not I, bad I, at. I could do a, 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 a free throw shot. Three pointer. Three yeah. pointers. Remember, I went to boarding school, so I I got all that shit on lock. You get me? Yeah. <laughs> so you know what I mean? I could do the fucking Eskimo roll for fuck's sake. Don't fuck about. <laughs> are you better? For, are you better at football? Yeah. 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 Maybe, maybe not so good now because I'm, you know, I'm getting on now, ain't I? What back in the day though? Were you? Back in the day, yeah, yeah. Who was the best in uh, drum and bass and jungle? And I reckon. And by the way, Mampy Swift says it's him. I don't think I, I've. I don't know. I don't know because it, it's a different era. <laughs> <laughs> a different era. You can't compare eras. <laughs> oh dear that's a great answer well done um so the first major rave that you played at energy it sounded like that was an amazing moment can you describe what that was like was it was it the best moment of your career no i've got different when people ask that question i always say there's different moments for different special times different different for different things you know what i mean that was a special moment because it was nerve-wracking as fuck firstly secondly it was um it was just, it was just, it was just like, wow, look at this. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, quite overwhelming as well. Do you know what I mean? To think, you know, I was playing at this fucking event. I was just like, 
thousands of people there. Do you know what I mean? Was, yeah, I'm, I remember I like, shh, my hand, was putting a needle down and my, my hand shaking like that. I was like, fuck, do you know what I mean? That had never happened to me before. Does that still happen now, ever? No, no, no. no. <laughs> Is that because you are a master at it or you're just not bothered? You just get used to it. You just get used to it, don't you? You just like learn how to cope. You just block things out. Just get on with the job. Do you know what I'm saying? And how many people were there at that energy? 20, 25,000, something like that. <laughs> I'm not surprised you were shitting it. Yeah, it was, it was quite intense. <laughs> 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 uh, was, it, was that the most intense moment you've you've had in your career? Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to ask because there, there have been intense times, like the first time in America, in a big in a big room. That's intense as well because it's a different it's a different um, different part of the world, and you've got to prove yourself all over again, haven't you? Do you know what I mean? So, and you know, America, you always think, wow, America, do you know what I mean? So you're going to, you put that pressure on yourself straight away, straight away, you've put that onto yourself because, you know, we all grew up thinking, wow, America, do you know what I mean? Get yeah. to America for the first time. Right, right. I mean, you, you, it's quite, it's ob your love of America is so obvious in the book. I mean, you, 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 you're sort of like your second home really. And again, we'll, we'll yeah, talk yeah. about some of the experiences that you had over there um, when we talk about V, because that was when you really went and had a great time in America. Um, <laughs> uh, what do you feel about America now? I love America. I love I love going to play in America because I've got some great friends there. Um, and, you know, people that the ravers over there, they're so in love with the music as well. Do you know what I mean? Because remember, you've got pockets in all of, in different cities, you know? It's not like, it's not like here where you've got masses in everywhere, do you know what I mean? Over there, there's the pockets of people in every city, and then you know, sometimes you go to some really small parties, but it's just really just vibes, you know what I mean? Just yeah. vibe, and it, you know, yeah, I love America, do you know what I mean? Even I still, it. even post, even though they've you know, they've had the Trump years and all that sort of stuff, which I can't imagine well, that you were a particular bedfellow with. That's a different, that's a completely different thing, and I think everyone knows my views on Donald Trump and, and the whole atmosphere and toxic thing that he's kind of created. Everyone knows my views on that, do you know what I mean? But at, in, in in terms of music, musically, it's all good because that's, you know, music is where we go to escape all, of all that shit. You know I mean, that's what we do. We bring music to escape all that shit. Do you know what I mean? Music is, is exempt from all that bullshit. Do you know what I mean? That's why we, it's, it's a form of us to escape from all that. Do you know what I mean? But that guy was fucking, oh, mate. Yeah, I know. Well, for good riddance from him. Uh, another question here from Lee James Blunt. He asks on Facebook, who was the MC that you most liked to DJ with in the 92 to 94 era, those early days? I liked MCMC. MC, uh, you know what I mean? I liked MCMC MC a lot when he was, when he, you know, when I, the days when we, we used to do Elevation a lot. And I liked him. I liked Morris. He was really good. He was a good guy and a good MC. You know what I mean? I liked him at, for that era there. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, and while we're at it, what is your views on MCs and the rise of them in the modern drum and bass scene? Um, and, and who have been, been your faves over the years, apart from MCMC? Well, um, watching them, watching the rise of the MCs has been great. Do you know what I mean? At first, some, some, of, the, some of the vibes I wasn't too keen on, and then some of them didn't know when to shut up. Do you know what I mean? But it's just like with us, do you know what I mean? You know, you, you try and error. Like, now nah, they're so professional. They're like so on it. Do you know what I mean? It's like a, they know, they, you know what I mean? These, these guys now, they know what they're doing. Now. Especially the top guys, they're just amazing. Do you know what I mean? They're just amazing. So, well. We've been told that you're not, though, uh, afraid to unplug a microphone from time to time. And in fact, no, not only that, Someone has asked the question about whether you once threw water over Stevie Hyper D. It was Shay Jones. Is that right? Is that correct? Yeah, it's correct. It is. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Because he wouldn't shut up. You know when I mean? was that? Where was it? He was rapping over vocals and shit. It's like, it's like, he's going, and there's that fucking some chick singing. It's like, what the fuck, Stevie, man? And, and his, his eyes were closed. He couldn't even fucking hear. He couldn't even see me going, Stevie! <laughs> God bless him. Rest in peace, Stevie. I love you, man. Uh, when was that? What year was it that you dashed the water over him? I can't remember, man. I can't remember. It was, it, was, it was in his early years. It was in his early years. Do you know what I mean? Because, you know, he, he, had to, he, you know, he came in and he was like, 
I can put you in a time shop with me. It's kind of easy. Stevie, just take it easy a little bit, Stevie, man. Take it easy, you know. But then, you know, was he, got, he, was a, he, was a, he was the best. He was the yeah. best. Does he remain the best to this day? He was, yeah, because he's ahead of his time. Right. He's so, he was way out there ahead of his time, man. There's guys, what the guys are doing now, Stevie was doing then. Yeah, of course. And how did he react when you chucked water on him? He was like, okay, man. <laughs> 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 he was coachable, yeah? He was teachable. Uh, and did he improve then? Did he did he listen to that and so go, okay, right, just, I need to work on that? He worked on it, man. He worked on it. And, you know, but when he gets in that zone, he was still like, blah, 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 blah. but he was so good. Do you know what I mean? You know what I mean? That, that, you know, he was so good. Well, and also, the Ravers loved him. Right? <coughs> so even if you didn't, and you were like, oh, you know, he's, Listen, singing, he's singing part over part me part vocals, but the Ravers I'm loved him. And... Talk over vocals, man. MCs, do not start spitting bars over vocals for fuck's sake. Please, come on, man. Do they still do it? Some people still get excited and carried away. Uh, that's a very diplomatic answer. Well done, Frost. Uh, right, we're going to, uh, in the next part, we're going to talk all about V. We're going to get into V. So make sure that you uh, don't miss this next episode because it's going to be fascinating. This is where Frost became top dog in the scene. Well, that's it for another episode of Raw. And if you like what you've heard, we'd love you to get involved. All of us here at Raw HQ buzz hard off how much you, the Raw crew, enjoy our work and your generous cash donations have been a huge help since our launch. But we're now a team of five, putting in combined 80 hours a week for no wages. We've got loads of plans to go further, expand our team and offer. But that does mean that our costs are also increasing. So we could really use your help to keep Raw growing and developing as you've done since we started. So please do check out our website initially. It's rawuk.com for interesting extra content and to get your hands on our first ever range of Raw merchandise. That's rawuk.com. We've also launched a new membership scheme where you can donate to create more interesting and fun content on an ongoing basis and you'll even get stuff in return. So head to patreon.com forward slash rawukpods. That's patreon.com forward slash rawukpods to see what's on offer. You can also join our YouTube membership, which is the same. Or if you're not bothered about membership, but you'd like to support us with a few quid as a one-off or repeat donation, head to our website and click the PayPal link. That website URL, one more time, rawuk.com. Respect to you for your support and for getting to the end of this episode. Please keep supporting us and help ensure there's more quality content coming your way on a regular basis. Oi, oi.